sir. Oh my gosh, wasn't that good? Wasn't that so good? How are you? Good, good. How does that feel to hear? We were standing backstage, we were listening to the music, um, and I said, like, here it comes, and, and, then, and then they clap. There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing better than that. What's that feeling like for you? It's, it's amazing because, I mean, this movie was so hard to make. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it's just full circle. We were only shooting, like, last year this time. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So a quick journey to the screen. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's barely been a year. And um, to, to think that that is possible within a year is mind-blowing. Yeah. Well, let me let me just say, after I see a film, if I really like it, I start to obsess over the people who made it and the people in it. So I had a total stalker Google fest with you. <laughs> and let's just, you know, they can't Google because they're in here. So we're just going to do a, a real life, we call it a live Google session, right? Sure. So here it is. So I put in your name uh -huh. and I found out a few things. Um, we'll start off. You're from Southern California. Yes, I am. Okay, so tell us about, you grew up in Orange County, right? I grew up in Irvine. Um, I was born in, yeah, I was born in Garden Grove. Um, and uh, yeah, my dad, uh, he worked the swap meets around Southern California and, and uh, finally when he got enough money together, he opened like a shoe wholesale warehouse in Paramount. And it's right across the bridge uh, on Rosecrans from Compton, the, the 710 bridge. So uh, yeah, he uh, he commuted every day 50 miles, so my sister and I can go to a nice public school. Yeah, um, I love the fact that the uh, I'm from Compton. Shout out to my mom over there from Compton, yeah. the original Compton, original CPT over in the <laughs> corner. <laughs> um, and um, so, but I love the fact that this shows different parts of LA because if you're from Compton, that area, Compton, there's also Linwood, there's Paramount, there's Bellflower, all that area yeah. that we don't see on film a lot. Like, yeah. we, don't, we don't get to see that, especially when people are even talking about the L.A. experience. It's a part of it, but it's a little removed. Absolutely, and uh, that's why I, I, I thought this, this film would be much more interesting if it was in Paramount rather than Compton. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's literally right there. And, and most people, they think of, like, the studio Paramount, but they don't yeah. realize that Paramount's an actual city. Yeah, and it doesn't look like the studio, Paramount. No, not at all. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. It's a good city, though. I've had some good times in yeah. Paramount. <laughs> yeah. growing up. Um, um, so, so the, um, the, the, the shooting, did, you know, were you, I, I remember my, my first films, I think you were much more diligent and, like, legal than I was when I, when I was starting. But was everything kind of up and up, on the up and up, or were you still in shots, or how was this working? Uh, we're, we're definitely breaking some rules. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I, I, I'll let it, like, you know, the, the movie's gonna come out, so I, I think I can say it now, but, um, you know, we shot in Gardena, because it's, it's, you know, it's between Compton and Inglewood, and, and um, you know, we, we also had a minor on set, so there's some safety considerations and stuff, but, um, but uh, <laughs> we were so broke, we couldn't even afford the full permit from Gardena, oh, so we stole we stole the shots. We we stole, we we paid the location, but we were shooting there like down low for about a week and a half. And the cops kept coming by. And we kept saying, "Yeah, we're a landscaping company. We're we're shooting like a promotional video right now." <laughs> and then you know, about, about the third time, the cops were like, "All right, gigs up. We know you're shooting a movie, dude. Like, just go and get the permit. It, just do it in the next day. We won't shut you down." And I was like, "Yes, sir." Yes, sir. Good, 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 good. Yeah. That's the fun stuff, though. That's the, that's the, <laughs> I miss it, I miss it. I try to say, Disney, let's just shoot, this is still this one, really quick. <laughs> They're like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't do that here. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, one of the other things I loved about it, so many things I love about it, we're going to talk about them all, but one of the things I loved about it is just the multicultural view of Los Angeles, which is how I grew up. I grew up. Compton, Linwood, me and my homegirls, we all had the same color, we were all the same color brown. We put our hands up, we were all the same color brown, yeah. but one was Filipina, yeah. one was Samoan, yeah. one was Guatemalan, yeah. and, and I was black. And yet, you know, that's just the brown, black and brown communities. Yeah. Um, and so I love the way you really kind of effortlessly show that hodgepodge of what those cities are like, but usually when we see films, it's always so segmented. And that's, you know, that's sort of the thing is, is that's the reality that I grew up with. But, you know, when I was trying to get money for this film, people, for some reason, were confused that 
the, the bulk of the film was between these Kore Korean American brothers and this 11 year old black girl. And I, it was just blew my mind because I didn't understand why that doesn't make sense. You know, to me, it's obvious, and, and you know, when you see it on the screen, there's not a, a second thought that, that crosses your mind that that's not something that's probable. Um, but, yeah, you know, it, to me, uh, that's what L.A. is, you know, and, and Jesus, I, those, Jesus raised me, you know, like, you know, my dad's store, like, uh, you know, those are the people that were carrying me around when I was a kid, and that's just, that was my reality. Uh, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about your 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 beautiful leading lady Simone Baker. We'll yes. give her another hand. Yes, she's fantastic. How amazing she's she? She's out there somewhere. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about her. Where did you find her, and and how did you discover this beautiful new talent? Absolutely. So you know, I mean, as you guys can see, it was really important that that that, you know, Camilla's character is the bridge between the two communities, and I, I really needed someone that was resilient uh, and, and positive and just, exu you know, just right when you see it, you want to love her. And I, I auditioned some regular actresses at first, and, and, you know, nothing against it. It was just, they were just too rehearsed. Um, so then me and my producer, James, and Alex, we, we started thinking, brainstorming. So we started calling some, some African-American churches in the area, but uh, through a... A suggestion from a friend, um, they suggested this place, Fernando Pullum Art Center, and, um, and I think Fernando's here. I love you, Fernando. Um, Thank but, you, Fernando. Yeah. But uh, the Fernando Pullum Art Center, it's in South Central, mm -hmm. and it's a community art center. They do music, you know, dance, you know, plays, and they, they open their facility with open arms, and that is where we found Simone. Okay. Yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. And so she can, uh, she can sing, she can dance, she can act, she can kind of do it all. Yeah. What was your process in working with her as a, maybe an untrained actor, your process directorially uh, of how you all were able to kind of bond and create this relationship? Well, first of all, Simone just naturally is not this character. She is very, you know. <laughs> Her favorite color is pink. You know, she didn't, she didn't know how to skateboard before this. And, and we spent a lot of time uh, just hanging out. Uh, in the beginning, it was just uh, me teaching her how to skateboard. And I would go to the center every day, and, and we would talk. And then, and then, you know, after a while, like, we started talking about the scenes, each indiv indiv individual scenes, and if there was something she was confused about or, or uh, you know, didn't understand, we talked about it. And it was a lot of just getting her comfortable. Um, and, but that was the magic was we rehearsed for about, I don't know, about a month and a half or so before we even shot. So when we stepped on set, she was ready to, she was ready to fly. Yeah. Nice, that's a nice time for rehearsal. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a nice length of time. She did a beautiful job. Simone, wherever you are. Kudos, my sister. Yes. Good job. Um, I want to ask you, you know, as you read uh, some of the reviews for the film, there is the inevitable comparisons to Spike Lee. Almost every single uh, review that I read about it is, is connecting it to Spike Lee, do the right thing because of kind of the summer of, of an uprising and a store and kind of those tropes. Um, so that's certainly being attached to the film. Was it in your mind in a really, there's some references, there's some things sure. that, that flirt around it, but was it very purposeful in, when you came up with the idea? It's, you know, as an as a ethnic filmmaker, it's, om it's, it's almost impossible to talk about race without some reference to Spike. Because, you know, I grew up watching his films, and, and I'm a huge fan. Um, it's, but at the same time, you know, I, I purposely didn't watch Do the Right Thing Again. And, and, but there's, there's just things in there that, that just are inspired by. And even though I didn't watch the film before I shot and I, and I tried not to think about it, it just bleeds in. And, and, um, so it wasn't like I'm going to make my version of that or, yeah. you know. Well, where did the idea come from to even uh, tackle this time? Well, the biggest influence for this film is actually a, a French film from the early 90s called, called uh, La N. Um, and that's basically what put Vincent Cassell on the map. If you and, haven't seen it, you should. It's yeah, it. and it's also in black and white, and it's about it's also about like in, in a riot, and, and also about uh, police brutality, and and um, you know these three disenfranchised, diverse friends uh, that are roaming around the city. And when I saw that film, it just blew my mind. 
Um, and it was also French, and at the time I was like, I, I wasn't into like international film, but it, it was just, just changed my life. Um, you know, and funny enough, you know, I auditioned for Spike Lee was going to make uh, an L.A. Wright's film back in the day, um, and I actually auditioned for it, but uh, it never, I don't think, it, it never got made, obviously, but, but uh, you know, it started getting my wheels turning, and, and you know, the riots, are, the L.A. riots are always seen as such a black and white issue, and, you know, uh, just a little bit of background info, my dad's store got looted. We got looted the last, sort of, like, the fourth day, and, and so we had a very personal tie to this experience, and, um, you know, the other films that are going to be made, I can't wait to see them because that's what film is for. There needs to be different perspectives on, on these things. And, but I just, I just felt like, okay, I don't think the, the Korean ex experience is going to be authentically uh, or accurately like, represented. And I felt like, well, I, I, I think I have the skill set and I think I have a compelling story that I want to talk about. Uh, so it just was this, this obsessive thing. And, um, you know, this year's actually the 25th anniversary of, of that riot. And I felt, okay, this is, it's now or never. So, um, last summer I just, I got some people together and we, we just like, we're really scrappy. We raised money in increments of three, six, nine thousand. And, and we just, we just made it happen. Yeah, you sure did. Um, the the idea that um, that uh, you can kind of play with uh, some of these really, really I don't know electrifying racial tropes. Yeah. Like for example, when um, when um, little sister, what's her name? What was her name in the thing? Uh, Camilla. Camilla, yeah. Of course, Camilla put it on screen in a big old thing. How did I forget? It's like, <laughs> Camilla is her name. That was cool, though. Um, but when Camilla, um, there was a moment that actually, you know, growing up in the city uh, really kind of put a lump in my throat when I first started watching the film. It was when she goes into Mr. Kim's store, and she goes and she reaches for the juice, and, she, and he's saying, you know, if you steal anything, I'll kill you. And you know, we haven't become acquainted with him and we haven't become acquainted with her. And she's walking back from the refrigerators back to the front. I don't know if anyone, uh, probably not, I don't know, anyone here remembers La the Latasha Harlan's case. Yes. But um, this was a case, so it was a 15, 16 year old sister in South Central. She went in, she got a juice, was a juice and something else. And, you know, literally I could cry right now thinking about it, but she was just simply, there's, it's all on video. Uh, and she, uh, he thought, it was a woman, thought she was stealing. You know the story. Yeah, soon as do. Yep, thought she was stealing and, and shot, shot her dead in the store. And, um, and so, and, 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 and got off, was, w walks free today and was never, um, was never jailed or incarcerated yeah. or never, never was held accountable for that death. And so you play with images like that, right? which are clearly in the head of anyone that kind of knows that, that history of the city. Um, and then the next minute, and so I'm feeling that, and then literally less than 10 minutes later, I'm rocking out to, to Hall and Oates. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And somehow, you know, being able to balance that tone and, uh, and me feel comfortable going back and forth between the two, I thought it was a real risky, bold, yeah. ballsy move. And I want you to just talk about a little bit about the responsibility of playing with those kinds of images and also your instincts as a filmmaker to, you know, kind of flex the creative muscles and do some more imaginative things sure. as well. Absolutely. So um, all those things were, were, I was very conscious of it. And, you know... <laughs> This is a scary movie to do because we're talking about very heavy issues and, you know, uh, you know, and, and the, even the, the whole backdrop, the overarching backdrop is, is the acquittal of the four officers, you know, with the, the Rodney King trial. And, you know, as we all know, like, that's still happening. Um, and so it was, I had to be conscious of all that stuff, but, you know, I feel like the most effective way to, meet, to, to reach people is you can't just play to one emotion. I mean, it can't just be just the whole thing, like, heart-wrenching, because then it's just like when you want somebody to pay attention 
you need to, it needs to be sort of like a dance, you know, and it's like music, like you, you have the crescendos and then you have even in like, like electronic music there, you know, there's a drop and everybody feels it. And I, I really, I just, I just felt like those are things I wanted to play with, but I don't know. I know some scary people growing up and I guarantee you they weren't scary all the time. You know, <laughs> you spend enough time with these people and, 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 uh, they were just as much clowns as everybody else. You just had to be around them long enough. And, you know, uh, it was just that fine line of, of trying to ride that. And, 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 but then I also had to show, like, why does this girl even like going there? Like, if it's just heavy all the time, there's no reason why. So, you know, those, that hollow note sequence, I was more playing with the, the emotional journey rather than, like, uh, you know, the tonal journey. And, and, uh, to me, I feel in filmmaking that uh, if it's emotionally justified, you can take some liberties. So, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where I was just writing that line. Okay. I like, I, 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 I like that. that, that uh, <laughs> I like that line. I knew some scary people, but they weren't scary all the time. That's good. If you see that turn up an episode of Queen Sugar or something, <laughs> know that I stole it from Justin. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was reading, uh, you know, some of the different reviews, just kind of trying to get the lay of the land of what your journey has been since Sundance. Uh, and um, I had to, I felt kind of the same way I do when I read a lot of the reviews about my work. I think, wow, these are nice, but gosh, it'd be nice to know what some black people thought about it. Absolutely. And because ain't no, ain't no black critics that they have a national platform, uh, as many as they should. Maybe there's a, a, a couple. Um, and so I, I, I kept reading, like, wonder what some Korean people think about it. Yeah. Um, Korean critical community, like critics, the press, like yeah. the Korean press. Um, are there any Korean film critics uh, here that have been able to consider the work? And have you been able to hear from, from people who have an understanding of, of kind of cinema and also an understanding of the specific culture? I mean, I, I think that this is a, a challenge when we're working with films by filmmakers of a certain place that the people who are considering and critiquing the work overwhelmingly are considering it from an outsider space, which is not bad, but there's never, we, it's very hard to get that, yeah. you know, very, um, the, the, the great film critic's eye with the cultural perspective. Sure. Are there any? Uh, I mean, you know, some of the Korean new local newspapers have covered it, but it's uh, not with any sort of opinion. And, and, and it's not like a film critic, it's just like a general sort of coverage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that sort of the thing is, uh, you know, Korean, at least as a Korean American, these, these are things that I don't get to talk about, you know. Um, and I covered in the film, or these intergenerational conflict. I'm here, and I, I'm, I was born here, uh, but oftentimes I just don't see eye to eye with, with the older generation. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes they don't, they think that what I'm doing is child's play. And they don't take it seriously. And so, you know, I don't think that they, I don't say they don't care, but they just aren't giving it very much attention. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same way. It's just uh, in that I, I just don't think that um, I've even gotten that much attention from that generation of, that, that, that run those, those publications, uh, that sort of any in-depth coverage at all. Well, uh, Justin and I want to encourage anyone out there who wants to be a critic who looks like us to please pick please. up your pens and your please. pads and criticize our work because it's important. It's really important. It's a big deal that we don't talk about a lot. Um, so speaking of the generations, uh, so first of all, in my Google attack on your film, I'm Googling everyone, and there's a really, really interesting thing about the man who played Mr. Kim, who I love the first scene. He's like, fuck you. Oh, fuck you. Fuck you. Just all the way across the street. I'm like, oh, that's so good. Um, and I'm sure it was just especially fun for you because Mr. Kim is? He's my dad. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I love it. So tell me, tell me about working with him. Um, and he was a child actor in yes. Korea? He's yeah. a child actor in Korea before he came. It's a great story. Tell yeah. it, tell it. So uh, my dad was basically the Macaulay Culkin of South Korea. <laughs> in the 60s, uh, when things were black and white, he had this sort of famous film that was like a Korean version of Godzilla. There's one scene that's so stupid. I want to see that so bad. Yeah. He's in like the eardrum of Godzilla and he has a huge oversized like Q-tip like trying to bang it out. <laughs> it's nuts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, I wrote the role for him and you know, one of the joys of this film was the idea of being able to share the screen with my dad. Um, and it's something now I have on film and I, I, can, I can show my future children and, and it's just like, it's immortalized so I, I that's, uh, you know, it's always going to be there. And, but I told him about the film and he was really confused. He was like, why do you want to go back to that? Why do you want to revisit a, a traumatic time in, in our history? And we've gone past that. Why are you looking back? But, you know, being an American, I'm like, no, we have to. This is important because, first of all, here's another fact is younger people, they don't even know what gook means. And that's a problem. I mean, some people are like, oh, isn't that good? Because at least they don't know what that. No, that's a problem because that means that history is getting erased. And that cannot happen, you know? And, and for me, yeah. And for me, when that word is, is spoken, it's so important that, that people know what that word means and that, that if someone is, is in a group and that word is uttered, that they say, no, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't use that word. And so, uh, you know, uh, my dad, he just, he just was like, okay, I don't, I don't get it. But it took a while, and I, I, I made him understand that, like, this is an opportunity for education. This is an opportunity to humanize people and, and to look back at that and, and to bring up conversation like we're having now. Um, but you know, him being the old cream curmudgeon that he is, <laughs> it took me three months to convince him. Once he finally said yes, first of all, he said, do not ever ask me for another favor. Don't, don't even ask me for $5. Uh, and, and, um, you know, here's a, here are the stipulations. One, no night shoots. <laughs> oh, so he was a, two, he was a picky actor. Yeah, two, I'm going to pick my own wardrobe. And my dad will hate me for saying this in public, but my dad wears a toupee. I was like, you got to take that shit off. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but it, <laughs> yeah. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. Trevor, turn off the live stream. <laughs> we, yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah, it was incredible though. Once he got on set, he, it was amazing to see him work as an actor. Yeah. He asked the right questions. You know, he, he asked for direction. You know, he, he was a professional actor and I will always have that for my memories till the day I die. Yeah, that was very cool, very cool. Yeah, good. You, you touched a little bit on the title. Uh, I told him backstage, I said, oh yeah, before we leave, I wanna make sure that everyone knows the social media handles so we can support the film and get people out. And then he told me what it was and I said, yeah, I can't say that. Uh, but the title, I can't, I can't say the title, but the title, why? You know, touched on it a little bit, but there has to be careful consideration of having a, a title that kind of, you know, um, uh, explosive. Yeah, and I knew I was playing with fire. I mean, you know, when we got into Sundance and, you know, the Korean news, you know, ran with it, uh, we got calls. We got calls from the com older Korean gentlemen saying, like, how dare you? And my thing was like, okay, cool, here we go. Um, watch the film and let's talk. Uh, but basically, you know, just a little bit of background, gook in Korean means country. And when the GIs came to Korea during the Korean War, they would say, Mi Gook Saddam, right? So that means American person. So Mi Gook is America, and that directly translated means beautiful country. That's what America means. So these, these GIs, they took that word, half that word, and made it into a racial slur. And we still use the word gook in the Korean language to this day. And, and to take that word away from us, and, and we, were, we were calling your country beautiful, and now, now it's a, 
uh, a racial slur that carried over to the Vietnam War. You know, it, it, most people don't know that that about that word. And and so you know, when we get to that point in the film when when Camilla asks, "Hey, what does that even mean?" Eli has a choice. He can he can choose to perpetuate the the cycle of hate and teach her the racial slur, or he can make a conscious decision to at least you know for now like protect her and 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 just teach her the the literal definition. And he chooses to do the latter. Mm -hmm. So you know, for me, it was like yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a that's a pivotal moment in the film. And and I thought like okay, it just we need to go there. We just and he, here's the thing about like. You know, I did. I did a. You know, Xavier, if he's here, like I, I did a, this this um, this interview with him, and it's just like, yes, we just need to face these problems head on. Yeah, we need we need we need to face them head on instead of tiptoeing around the subject because we get nowhere. So I mean, you know, the title. Let's talk about it. You know, let's educate and let's 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 put it out there. And now. Everyone, at least in this room, knows what that means. And, and if it's ever said in, in, in that racial slur uh, context, you know that's not cool. Yeah. Good, good. Well, we talk about it, we share, we uh, foster understanding between each other, and no tiki torches from any cowards anywhere in this country is gonna stop us from doing um, Tiki torches? Really? Yeah, it's so crazy. Are we supposed to be scared? <laughs> yeah, it's why crazy. you why why are you appropriating other culture to like forward your <laughs> What's nuts. wrong? Like yeah. get your own thing. Yeah, like nuts. pick up a sick and light that on fire. This <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, this nuts. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, it's a sickness, it's a mental illness. Um the um the one thing that I want to ask before we open it up a bit, and uh, we'll give an uh, audience a, a chance to ask some questions, is, you know, I, as a black filmmaker, uh, whenever I sit down and do an interview, I mean, literally 99 out of 100 times, um, I'm asked about the issues of the film, and I work a lot around race and culture and women, womanhood and all of those things, and so that's the core focus of the interview. Um, and I'm very seldom asked questions like my colleagues uh, who are white men are asked, which is questions about making film, yes. like the filmmaking, the craft. Yes. We have cinematographers also. We, we direct actors as well. Absolutely. We also uh, uh, direct the production design and have casting directors, right? It doesn't always have to be that, right? Exactly. So, Get ready for your craft questions. Ready? Here I'm we ready. go. I'm ready. Cinematography, badass. Who did it? What was the co collaboration with this person? Um, and you know, what was the kind of starting point for the look? And kind of just bring us into your your conversations about cinematography. I'm so happy we get to talk about this. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. I, I don't get to talk about this enough. My cinematographer is here. His name is Anti Chang. <laughs> Stand up. Stand up, where is he? Stand he's up. there, good job. Right there. Beautiful. Yeah. Really nice, gorgeous. And you know, um, we were, we, so I like to shoot like a lot of experimental stuff and, and you know, like there's a group of us and, and I, was, uh, I was acting one day in one of the experimental shorts and, and uh, first half of the day there was a DP and he was just so-so, sorry, um, but then the second, DP that came in the middle of the day was Anti. Okay. He just picked up the camera, and he was so good at handheld, and he was so intuitive. Mm -hmm. He knew when to come in, when to give space, mm -hmm. and he knew nothing about what we were doing, but he just knew uh, the dynamics of, of the scene. He maybe, you know, after maybe like uh, one take, he got it, and I was like, God, this guy's a gangster. Mm -hmm. um, if I get a if I get if I get a chance to work with him, I'm, I'm going to do it uh, on on a on a bigger scale and. So, you know, when this film came up, it was just like, okay, who are the people that, 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 that I feel like need to be discovered? Mm. And I was like, Auntie is the man. Um, just, <laughs> here's something that's crazy. He's still at USC grad school. Wow. Fantastic. It doesn't matter. If you got the goods, you got the goods. It doesn't matter if you, it doesn't matter. But, but um, 
when we met, I told him, I told him some inspirations and, and you know, why I wanted to shoot black and white. And, and um, you know, he just, he's the type of guy that just goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he doesn't talk much. He's, he's almost scary in that way. <laughs> but then the first day, he came with some comps. And, and, um, and uh, one of the first things he showed me was stills from Schindler's List. Um, and at first, I was like, whoa, okay. Like, I, I didn't even think about that, but he's like, well, look at how the light comes in, and we're shaping the light, and we can have these sort of, uh, you know, hard light coming in. Um, let's do this. Let's try to do this with natural light. Uh, and I said, dude, you know, okay, I'm, I'm glad you said natural light, because we're not going to have time, I mean, to be setting up big, big, and nor do we have the money. Uh, <laughs> natural light, good. Yes, yeah, let's yeah. go with that. Yeah. I like it. So, <laughs> yes. So it was, you know, just, just over the course of, of, of pre-production, you know, a lot of conversations. And, you know, one thing that was important to us was use, using good glass. Um, we use Kawa uh, Anamorphics. And, and um, you know, we were shooting. Uh, my, my, originally, I wanted to shoot on, like, 16. Just, you know, the workflow and also, the, you know, uh, the price that getting, getting film developed. I wouldn't, you know, dailies and all that stuff. It would just it didn't make sense. So we had to go digital. So at least a glass we needed something special, so, so that's why we made that choice. But, um, and then, you know, um, we used a lot of uh, moving masters. So uh, because we're in mostly one location, we didn't want to put the camera down and make things static because uh, it, people would get bored, you know? We needed to be dynamic and, and capture sort of what the characters are feeling, so we had the camera constantly moving. And you know, the first three takes, we cover most of the characters through the, the masters. And after that, then we punch in and, and yeah, and then we start picking off things that, that I need. Um, but yeah, those were like, you know, the general broad strokes of, of the things that were in consideration. Isn't it nice to hear people of color filmmakers talking about craft? It's a rare thing. It's like a unicorn. <laughs> it's like, is he really there? Yes, he did. Um, fantastic. Um, the casting process, you talked a little bit about it, but I thought that this was like a really deep bench in terms of the cast. Um, everyone did a lovely job. Uh, you know, uh, shout out, of course, to Simone, but also the brother. Yes. Uh, is the brother here? Brother? David, stand up. Brother. Hey. 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 You know what? Both brothers. The black brother, too. Where's the, is the black brother He's here? in New York. He's black in New York. Black brother and Korean brother were both fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, so so uh, knew them both personally or discover, discovered them through casting? Yeah, so David, uh, the, the guy who plays my brother, Daniel, um, I've known him for, for a while. And, and you know, he, he's a stand-up and also has a YouTube channel. And here's the thing is... There's plenty of, um, you know, people want, that say there's, n there's no talented Asian actors. I'm sorry, excuse my French, but fuck that. <laughs> that is not true. You know, so, you know, David, I always knew he's talented. He just hasn't had the opportunity or, or the right vehicle. And, and so I wrote this for him, mm. you know. I played to his strings. I knew he could sing. He's so smooth, right? <laughs> and... and um, and you, you know, I just I just made sure that he was he was gonna get there. But but I I, I was without a doubt in my mind knew he could do it, um, because he's mostly known for comedy. But I'm like, dude, you're deep, bro. <laughs> you could do this. <clears throat> also, you know, just how David grew up too. He he's from Sac. He's from Sacramento, and his parents own a, a beauty supply, a black beauty supply uh, store. So he he lived this too. Um, so you know, it, 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 that's how I found him. We, you know, I wrote the part for him. Uh, dude, Curtis, he's my brother. He is my brother. Um, I was looking for somebody to play this, and I wanted someone that, again, to discover somebody. And I was in New York, um, and, uh, and I asked some indie filmmaker friends, hey, do you know, who's a guy, man? And one of my friends suggested uh, Curtis Cook Jr. Um, his dad is also an actor, incredibly talented actor. Curtis Cook, you know, he's... he's yeah, he's in Roxanne, Roxanne. He's, you know, he's in, um, um, he's in a bunch of stuff. But, uh, you know, he's, he's like second generation actor. And I saw him in this short called The Amateur. And it's now that film is getting made into a Netflix feature. But, but um, he's just, God, he was just, even in a short, you know, in a short, you're like, oh, I only got like, I only got like 10 minutes of screen time. 
So people can tend to overact. This guy, he just was like, nah, I'm, I'm just here. And he also did this film where, where he played a gay guy called uh, Nazim Malik. And with no, not even like hesitation, he just destroyed it. And I was like, okay, dude, I sent him a script. I said, dude, you don't, I don't even need to see you act. Can you, just, can you just please come to California and shoot this with me? And he was like, let me read it. And then he, he read it and he called me back. I said, okay, where do I sign up? I said, all right, man, we don't got, <laughs> we don't got money to, to put you up. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your, you sleep at my house. I will feed you breakfast. My wife, like, made him breakfast every morning. <laughs> um, but he was just down. He was just a, he was down. And, and, dude, you guys saw, he just, that character is, is touchy. Yeah. Because, you know, you know, the stereotype of an angry black man, he, there, it needed to be, his feelings needed to be justified. And I knew he had the sensitivity to ground it and humanize that character, and he did. He kills it, yeah. Yeah, he did a beautiful job, beautiful job. All right, my last question before I uh, open it up to a couple questions from the audience is, I just want you to break down New York Times style, um, you know, so they always have the filmmakers, the filmmakers, talk about a scene, anatomy of a scene, mm -hmm. right? So you're gonna go through, you're gonna tell us everything we need to know from script to shot selection to everything about getting to the hospital and that hospital scene at oh, the wow. very, very end. Yeah. And shout out to your DP because at the very end when he's, uh, when he's on, when you go over to him and he's punching himself and he comes out, I was, I, was, I was sitting there and I was like, pull out, pull out, pull out, pull out. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden the camera goes back, I'm like, yes! I would have done that. So good, so good. So, this is, a, 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 so you, 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 you know, it's outside the, 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 the store. We see her, you, you're the frozen moment. Take it from that to yeah. uh, the, the, the final piece in the hospital. How'd you design yeah. the whole thing? So at that point, I needed, things, I needed time to, to slow down. And I needed people to feel you know, it was chaotic before that, no. Everything that led up to that moment, we need to feel, like, viscerally, because it's important, because what these, what these characters, what they've caused is this, right? And so they need to feel that. So I always wanted to be as real time as possible. Um, you know, not giving the audience the, the cop out of, of letting them turn away or anything. You just have to look at that, and so, it was like, how, how, do, how do we make this feel as real time as possible? And, you know, in the beginning, there's a few cuts. Uh, but, and this comes a budget. It's just like, if I could have at first, uh, there's this famous sort of um, wonder where it's in, on, on a car hood going through the streets of Paris. Have you seen this before? A wonder is when you don't cut. So when we're, when we're shooting. Yeah, we don't do takes. You're yeah. just like, we're going to do this whole thing in one take. It was really difficult to do. Um, but you had a long one. Yeah, yeah, I had a long one. It started from when you got out of the car. Out of the car. Into. Yeah. And then it followed you and left the, 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 the brother. Yes. And then followed you on the back. How did you yeah. think of that? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I keep going. I need to know the back. Yeah, I need absolutely. To know about the water, absolutely. the whole thing. So, yeah. So, um. I wanted the whole thing to be one or this stupid filmmaking, like, you know, you know, ego thing. But I, okay, I was like, that's not possible. <laughs> we shot at USC uh, uh, Hospital. And shout out to USC because they, they hooked us up. That, that was, that, that, I mean, they took pennies, pennies on dollar for that location. But um, we had to rehearse it. That's the only way. We rehearsed it. And, and, and um, you know, it wasn't, with, it wasn't with Simone. So I basically was like, Auntie, let's do this. I just walked through the scene. And we looked at all the locations, and I was like, okay, how can we connect this whole thing? Um, so it was, it, it was from out of the car, and the whole thing from out of the car is all the way in, and it was just basically, uh, it needed to be rehearsed. And at first, Auntie, you got you to own up to this, he wanted to cut it up. He, he, he wanted, he's like, this is too hard. We, don't, we only have a certain amount of hours. Uh, let's cut it up. And that is, yeah, that's a smart thing to do. I'm not going to lie. Because wonders take a long time. Yeah, wonders take a long time because if it's not right, um, you know, you got, you got to go again. The whole thing is bunk. Um, so it was just about, like, me and Auntie just really being in sync. 
And, and once we started going, like, the first take was just, like, it was good. So I was like, okay, we got it. Like, we're not going to cut this up. Um, all right, let's push it further. And then, you know, then, it was, then I got to actually work with, with um, Curtis and be like, hey, where, where, where are you at? What do you feel? And when I told him, hey, I'm just, I'm just going to throw this out there, man. I want, you, I want you to start punching yourself. And he was just like, what? Like, no. And I was like, dude, if this really happened, like, how guilty would you feel? And you cannot blame anyone anymore. And you have to sit with this. Where would you go? And he's like, got you. Let's go. So we did, and then, you know, he did that, and, and it just, it just the, the whole thing just went up, up another level, and it just got electrified. But, you know, technically, it was mostly in the, it was mostly in the camera rehearsals. Yeah. Great job. Thank you. Beautiful job with Thank it. Thank you. Um, all right, so. Ava, Ava. I think we've got a time. It's done? Yeah. No time, he says. <laughs> we, t- we, we, we spent all the time? Yeah, we have to get a sound check coming Gotta up do a for sound tonight's sorry, performance. God, I teased yeah. it. I shouldn't have said anything. I'm so but, sorry. They're like, what a tease. So sorry. But let me just say before we go that this film opens in Los Angeles on Friday, August 18th, at two locations. <laughs> two locations. Shout out, shout out to Samuel, Samuel Goldwyn for picking up this film. Thank you. And, Thank you. Um, and this film comes out. It's playing at LA Live in the Arclight. Right? Arclight like Hollywood. Arclight yes. Hollywood. And then the next weekend, the 25th, it opens uh, around the country. It's going to need you tweeting. It's going to need you Instagramming. It's going to need you picking up the phone and calling a friend. Tell them the handles. Gook Film. Yeah. Gook Film. At, on Twitter, on Instagram. Yeah. Tweet now and uh, Instagram now and support this brother. Congratulations, Justin. Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you, guys.